The Scream Kings are in no way responsible for any encounters with the paranormal, extraterrestrial abductions, eldritch insanity, hauntings, curses, hexes, demonic possessions, cryptozoological sightings, or any loss of sleep that may result from listening to this podcast. This is a Scream Kings podcast. I'm Max George. And I'm Nathaniel Darkish. And do not raise your voice at me. I am your podcaster. <laughs> I'm so excited we're doing this show again. Uh, I love Hereditary. And this is, yeah, definitely part two. Ooh, it's our first part two episode we've done because this movie is so huge. But more importantly, it's because we have another awesome awesome interview that we were able to do all right and so i guess without much ado let's just launch right into it so this individual is marshall d moore and he has done some incredible things um when he was telling me some of the stuff he's worked on i about lost it um he has worked on both nightmare on elm street 2 um, Freddy's Revenge and Wes Craven's New Nightmare 1994 and as you find out in the interview I just completely nerd out with him he is one of the vice presidents of operations up at the Utah Film Studios in Park City um, and he's a wonderful and awesome guy so I hope you all enjoy this interview it's grandma you know you were her favorite right so if you just kind of wanted to give us a short little bio about yourself, how you got into film, what's your story? Well, my name is Marshall Moore. I, uh, I guess I've been around film my, my whole life in different ways. I, I, I grew up kind of in the shadow of watching my parents uh, produce, write, and create a little bit. You know, they, uh, I guess my first experience working in the industry was as an actor. I started as um, a child actor in, in uh in New York City and Los Angeles, uh, appearing in you know thirty second commercials that would air on the Tonight Show or or regionally, and um, a lot of print ad work. You know, as a model from the time I was like three years old to seven, and then I kind of grew out of that cute stage, and then it became you know work after that. It was hard to get jobs, and I kind of didn't do that anymore. I went back to being a, a regular kid playing baseball and uh, you know sports and that kind of thing. And then by the time I got to uh, I would say uh, college, again, my interest came back, but in a different way. I had spent some time growing up uh, going to movie sets, you know, with my with my parents. My mom worked as an assistant for Sam Peck and Paul, and uh, so I was on a lot of his sets growing up, and, uh, you know, a lot of other sets that they would be on and around, and I would just, like, watch the crew work, and I would think, wow, these are really cool jobs. I'd I think I'd rather be behind the camera. Yeah. And in front of it, there's a lot of pressure being in front of it, you know. So uh, I, I kind of like the atmosphere and the vibe better behind it. And even when I was acting in commercials, I would, you know, be get to be friendly with the crew uh, more so than my fellow cast members. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what I, I remember. So naturally, I, I gravitated towards that. So that time I hit college, my parents had a, an independent film picked up called uh, Great Quigley by a company called Canon Films, and, and I raised my hand and said, hey, can I leave college and go to work on that, because that's what I'm going to college for, and uh, so I left my junior college in Los Angeles and went to New York, and I spent about four months working on a movie called Grace Quigley with Captain Hepburn and Nick Nolte. Oh my gosh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, so it was her last starring role, and uh, she played opposite Nick Nolte, a story about a woman who uh, basically wants to end her life. Um, and sees a way to by meeting a hitman. Wow. But instead of, uh, he, but he ends up liking her and won't do the job. Sure. And uh, then they end up going, kind of going into business together to uh, end people's lives who don't want to live anymore in a in a comedic in a comedic way. So it's more of a comedy than it is a serious drama. Okay. But uh, anyway, that was the movie I went to work on, and that that led me to work with the company that made the film, Canon Films, in their Los Angeles office. And I spent a couple of years working on their movies on set and in their corporate office. And then 
and I eventually fell into the career 20 years as a location manager for wow. film and film and television. Uh, I call it my accidental accidental career because I was literally hand picked out of a group of people only because I had a photography hobby. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that kind of started me off on, on that career, and that career ended up bringing me to Utah when I, I got offered a job on a movie called The Stand, which was a mini series for ABC. And then uh, that, I've been in Utah for 24 years because of that you know, movie. I ended up moving here, wow. working on Touch by, an- Touch by an Angel for eight seasons, and then uh, director of the Utah Film Commission for seven years. And then now I work at the Utah uh, Film Studios as the VP of Operations and Marketing. So it sounds like you've kind of moved all around as far as film productions go. Do you mind telling our audience what you do now and kind of your responsibilities that you have? Yeah, I suppose all I, I did then led to what I do now. Sure. And, and that is uh, manage, uh, manage Utah Film Studios. So Utah Film Studios is located in uh, Park City, Utah. And I am the vice president of operations and marketing. We have a very small staff there. Uh, there's, uh, of course, we have the ownership, but there's, we have a stage manager, Doug Arnold. We have our content manager, Zach Preach, uh, Emma Snow, our administrative assistant and studio coordinator, and then myself. Awesome. We kind of uh, op- operate the 91,000 square feet that we have there, and we currently are hosting the TV series Yellowstone with uh, Kevin Costner. They've been in the building for about a year now. So uh, we, our job is to make sure they're having a good experience at the studio, and uh, and then you know when the time comes, our job is to then find someone else to to use it as well. And I know kind of your interactions with me. You've mentioned, I mean, obviously this is a horror podcast, and you mentioned some pretty right. big iconic horror movies that you've worked on. Do you mind telling us a little bit about those? We, I'm just nerding out completely. You sent me that text, and it was hard to focus at work for the rest of the day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't, you know, I didn't know if that was going to be part of what we were going to talk about. We were just going to talk about the studio and hereditary uh, filming at the studio uh, last year, or you know how that transitions into you know some of the things that um, I, I worked on through the years of being a location manager. And you know, the, you never pick your genre; the genre picks you. So to sure, speak. sure. And uh, and if you know, we can. Yeah. You can definitely have you on again if you'd be interested. We actually are planning to do a Nightmare on Elm Street episode here in a few, so we would love the insight. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, as you mentioned, I worked on uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, in uh, around 1985. I was the, the credits, when you read the credits, it says third assistant director. It was because second, second assistant director hadn't even really become a formal title yet. They didn't really know what to call that extra assistant director on the set, so they used the European term as third assistant director so you will see that on the screen credit that was my job so my job was to get the cast in makeup so i would meet um, robert england every morning wow uh, get him into his makeup makeup chair at about four or five in the morning he would spend about three hours getting his prosthetics put on and uh, i would be the one there with him in the morning getting him whatever he wanted and checking him in you know on the daily production report so you know his time would start then so uh, my job was being cast in, in makeup hair wardrobe and on the set on time for the right scene that we would be shooting uh, that day. Freddy's Revenge was directed by a guy named uh, Jack Shoulder, and of course produced by New Line Cinema. Yeah, it was a, it was a kind of a crazy shooting schedule, mostly night. There was some day stuff, and we traveled a little bit to a place called Fontana, California, and shot some of the you know the the boiler room stuff there in an old abandoned steel mill. Oh, that's awesome! So it, 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 yeah, and I'm actually in it too. Oh. Uh, uh, we pulled it up the other day at work. Oh yeah, uh, and on um, YouTube, the scene at the pool where Freddie comes out, you know, out of the pool. Yeah. And uh, or, yeah, and uh, you know, scares all those kids at the party. Uh, I, I'm the one in the red and white baseball jersey. Okay, uh, well, that's what I look like. I'm going to be watching that again. I was about 23 years old uh, then, so I look, look a little different. But um, <laughs> yeah, so that that was that one. So then, a number of years went by and. They actually reached out to me again to do the very last installment of uh, the New Nightmare. With Wes Craven's New Nightmare, and I spent about five months working with Wes Craven. Nicest guy I've ever worked with. He respected everything I did as one of his department heads and was very appreciative. And of course, the interesting thing about Nightmare 7, that's what we called it when we were shooting it, but you know, released as Wes Craven's uh, New Nightmare, was we were actually filming during 
a Northridge earthquake in 1994. Okay. Remember that earthquake? Vaguely, yeah. I remember reading about it at least. Very, very bad. Seven point something on the Richter scale. Yeah. Brought Los Angeles to a standstill for a number of weeks. Yes, yeah. Anyway, we were in the middle of production when that, sh- that earthquake shut us down for about three days. And then when we came back, uh, Wes, you know, the story is actually about Freddy rising in reality, not in the dreams anymore. He's, he's crossed over into reality. Right, kind of like this communal consciousness has kind of created. Yes. It's brilliant. I, I love New Nightmare. So if you remember that whole sequence, there's a lot of little earthquakes going on in L.A. You're right. Uh, so like it's foreshadowing. Oh, my well, God. If you watch very closely, all the B-roll stuff of, of Heather Langenkamp driving through uh, the city is all actual footage of earthquake damage that we went out and shot with police escort three days after that earthquake. Oh my god, that's amazing. Yeah, so that's one interesting fact there when you're watching that movie. But yes, I love I love what you said too. It is That, that movie is... I could watch that one over and over again because it was so smart the way he crafted that story. It is, yeah. The whole... I mean, not to get too deep into it, we've got to talk about Hereditary, but the whole um, kind of mythos that he created for Freddy and just kind of this demon that you know, needs human consciousness to survive. I, I connected with that quite, quite deeply just because I, I believe in a lot of that stuff as well. And so it was just, I don't know, Wes Craven, he was a genius. Yeah, we shot that in uh, Tarzana, California, Pasadena, you know, Los Angeles. But uh, yeah, we spent like three weeks in one house there, just kind of took over the neighborhood. But yeah, that was, that was a really, that was the last movie I did in California before moving to Utah. But I'd done the stand the year before, but I hadn't moved to Utah yet. So the stand was the miniseries for ABC based on the Stephen King novel. And it's a shame my co-host couldn't join. He's like Stephen King's number one fan. He is just absolutely <laughs> a, obsessed with him. Well, Red- I shot here in uh, mostly in Salt Lake City. That's uh, the fan. Wow. About ninety days. Were, ninety days of it were filmed in Utah. Okay. About ten were in uh, Vegas and Pittsburgh. Wow. Yeah, that's. Oh, I'm just nerding out so much right now. I've got to focus. <laughs> um, so let's talk about Hereditary. Both me and my co-host, we absolutely, absolutely thought this movie was stunning in every which way. Uh-huh. We were blown away by how scary it was, by how good the acting was. Talk to us about Hereditary. How was it like filming something so amazing? Well, I can, I, I, and I can only speak to what I did in my capacity. And, sure. Uh, EP of operations for the studio where it was filmed, and, and Hereditary had a presence in the studio for about twelve weeks. Okay. Uh, they they filmed there for between three and four weeks, uh, and and the all the interiors of the house where they live are on our stage three at Utah Film Studio. Oh my gosh! So, um, yeah, it was a, a, a fabulous set. Oh yeah, it was stunning. Um, all the bedrooms, the the, the family room. Uh, all that was, every time we brought somebody to look at the set, they'd like, oh my gosh, this was so real. Well, that's, you know, kind of the point, but it <laughs> is still movie, ma- movie magic at the end of the day. Right. Um, you know, as you're standing in the set, you look outside and you see the walls of the stage. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so let me, uh, I can, I can definitely talk to what I witnessed and felt and saw when I was on set, hanging around on set. There was always a somber tone that you kind of feel. Sure. Movie. Sure. Too. It kind of translated into the what was happening uh, in the building too with the crew. Wow. I, I, I remember one specific instance, incident instance where the A camera operator Brian Sullivan uh, was pacing out in the lobby during the lunch during the lunch break, and he was just. Uh, I said, Brian, what's going on? He goes, I. He said, I think I just shot the most iconic piece of footage in my whole career just five minutes ago and uh, and in and, and it was the it was the piano wire scene yep. <laughs> if you're familiar with that yes uh, scott actually talked to us thing. about that well there you go yeah. and so yeah i remember talking to him a few minutes after this had happened and what how much of an impression it had and the whole crew felt that way too when the movie's being filmed like everything seemed so real i think ari Aster did a great job of bringing that vibe to set and of course his cast uh yeah i felt the same way you did about tony collette when i saw the movie I t- texted somebody right away, and I said, uh, Oscar-worthy, something like that. Absolutely, and I, I'm in the same opinion. 
uh, I was we were just completely blown away. You know, where you were talking about kind of that somberness on the set, it, it reminds me, you know, a lot of the stories that you hear about, you know, classic horror movies like The Exorcist, where everyone kind of felt like the set was cursed and there was this, you know, weird kind of supernatural feeling on the set. And I think that's very indicative to the caliber of Hereditary to kind of generate those same feelings that something is masterful as the exorcist could pull off yeah and i don't know if they knew they were doing that at the time i couldn't really tell whether the crew felt wow this is going to be a classic horror movie i knew that they knew that they felt that tony collette was getting the performance of a lifetime mm-hmm. and, and that alex wolf was equally as good uh, yeah. um but i also felt like you know there were you know and, and when you're managing a building you're dealing with uh, you know, you hear the other things like, oh, um, there's a weird sound coming from over there that, t- that Tony is hearing, and she cut her scene a couple times, because she can you guys deal with that? You know, so we would, those are some of the things that we would deal with. Oh, wow, well, yeah. On a, on a completely different level, but it was true, apparently there was a sound leak coming in on the stage from uh, the engine brake on the, the 40, uh, which backed up against us, which was been fixed. But it was like bleeding under one of the doors or into the into the uh, HVAC system. Okay. And and it was so quiet in there, and she was getting such an intense performance that you could hear anything. Yeah. You, know, you could even hear stuff that was happening outside of a sound stage. <laughs> um, that's how that's how kind of intense it was. Oh, that's amazing. Um, do you have a favorite part of the movie? I do. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I guess there's a few favorite parts, but <laughs> I mean, I guess it's the the seance sure. scene with the dad and uh, when they come in the middle she wakes up in the middle of the night and they come down and she's got the glass and, and she's almost hysterical you know but but I could feel her angst you know and it was so real that I was like hyperventilating <laughs> well and the, the hysteria she was portraying you know oftentimes we hear yeah. hysterics and you think you know person going you know balls to the wall crazy for lack of a better term but her method of portraying hysteria i thought was much more authentic to real life just kind of this almost hyper energy but the energy yeah. is kind of erratic and all over the place yeah and then i you know that that, that seems fantastic and then just there's a little bit scenes in the classroom with alex wolf or oh, a yeah, really good God, yeah. where he was uh you know possession was coming upon him and i thought those were really well well played as, as well and of course there's the scene in the car I don't want to get too much away there, but... Uh, oh, good you know grief. About. Yeah, yeah, that scene. <laughs> my co-host and I, Nathaniel, we both agree that that's probably the scariest moment of the entire movie was just that, you know, three minutes focusing yeah. Yeah. on the facial expressions that Alex Wolf was portraying. It was... Oh, it, yeah, it, it really sticks well with you. And shot. Yeah, and then the mood throughout the whole piece, the, the lighting, the, uh, the pacing... All that for the first you know, ninety percent of it. I don't know. I don't know if I'd experienced anything like that for that long, that at that high of a level. Well, and I think Ari did a really good job at kind of letting the camera become another actor. You know, it would move around and dwell on certain scenes that really got to you and made you very uncomfortable. You know, a lot of horror movies I think nowadays rely on the jump scare. Um, you yeah. know, it makes good money and it, it sells movies, but a movie like Hereditary, the horror is not in the jump scare. It's in that discomfort that you feel for the length of the movie. And then that. Yeah, it is. It's uh, very uncomfortable, isn't it? <laughs> absolutely. It, you know, for me, a good mark of a true horror movie is the feelings you feel after you're done watching the movie. You know, and I work a part time night security shift where I'm walking around at 2 a.m. at a hotel and. After seeing that movie, I was checking behind my back the whole night, making sure nothing was following me, you know? And it, uh, it's brilliant. It was really brilliant. Well, I think that's the, the beauty of Hereditary is the mood that it creates and it sticks with you. And it doesn't try to overly scare you. It just is the story itself and what the doom, I think the doom, the pending doom yeah. that you feel throughout the, um, throughout as, as the movie builds to its climax is is what makes that movie great absolutely and you know i was talking to my co-host and another thing we really loved about hereditary was your marketing 
you know, in the trailers, you'd see it, and you <laughs> you obviously knew it was a very scary movie, but you had no idea what it was about. I had no idea that it was going to be about demons until I was sitting in the movie theater. Right, right. Well, A24 did a great job, uh, you oh. know, with their distribution and uh, and picking it up. Uh, but uh, as far as the, the facility is concerned, the, the studio itself, we, the story is we almost did we almost didn't get it there, mm. uh, but if it was for Scott Chester, who you interviewed already, who uh, lived, lives nearby, and he had filmed at the studio just a few months earlier, uh, he brought it to their attention. They thought, oh, we don't need a big studio, it's going to cost us too much, but they had a really big set. So yeah. the set went well, but we, the stage three that they were on is 15,000 square feet. It's 150 feet by 100 feet and 35 feet to the grid, and... You're not going to find that just anywhere looking around in a warehouse without without some kind of obstruction, you know? Sure. Uh, and and sound for So God came to me and he said, hey, can you make us a deal? We know we can't afford, what, let's say, Yellowstone or Blood and Oil or a network series or you know, a big studio would pay or an independent film. So, you know, I went, went to the owners. At that point, there were two. And I said, you know, I think we should do this movie. What, what What's the best we can do on our end? And... And they agreed to it, so we were able to uh, get them in there. Well, and I think that really benefited that movie just in, you know, the scenery itself was absolutely gorgeous. And you kind of had this juxtaposition between this beautiful scenery, this cabin set in the woods, and then this complete unnerving discomfort throughout the length of the movie. And when we found out it was locally filmed, I was stunned that... One, Utah allowed such a powerful, you know, demonic movie in the state, but also just, you know, it almost made me proud that such a fantastic horror movie was filmed in my backyard, you know? Park City is an hour away from where I live. It, oh, it was amazing. Well, that's the, that's the thing is you think of Utah as Disney and High School Musical, but, you know, you can also think of it as The Stand or Halloween. Those, those were shot here, too. So, um... The thing with uh, the state allowing it and all that, I think what we should be most proud of is what you just said, is that they made a great movie and told them a great story and executed it with Utah, using Utah crew and, and cast for a lot of it, you know? Right, and that kind of leads me to another question we had for you, um, was, you know, obviously Utah has a lot of pros, I'm sure it has a lot of cons, uh, as far as a filmmaker and part of the film crew, what are some of your favorite things about Utah and kind of the more challenging things about Utah when it comes to making movies? Well, I think one of the easier things about filming here is getting around. Uh, you know, except the construction season, of course, that makes it a little more difficult, but still. Uh, so my transition from uh, Los Angeles to here, that was one of the things that I loved most. And jokingly, Producers would always ask me, oh, how far is that? How far is that? If they were from out of town, I'd say, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. And they'd say, why is everything 20 minutes? And I said, because it is. <laughs> and, and they were like, you're just making that up. And I'm like, no, really, everything's about 20 minutes. And then the producer who would say that, he goes, you're right, everything is about 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, you know, except you're going, except you're going, you know, out of the valley, you know, so, which we did. So that's one thing. And then the, just the variety of, uh, places to film in types of locations from, you know, that are within an hour of, uh, of most production offices where they are. So you've got the, you've got the natural terrain, you know, the, the, the water, the, the woods, and then you've got Salt Lake City. And then you've got the small towns in between, like uh, Magna and Payson and, um, you know, some of those from Park City even that, that, that support film and and uh, you know, create all those different looks. So I think the variety of locations that are centrally located are some of the things that are are great about Utah. And then the ability to use those places that people allow you to film on location, and then the permitting processes are basically they're 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 thorough, but they're not restrictive. So you can you can get something done in a timely manner because film operates on a different schedule than most other businesses, as you know. Right. There, you, know, you, have, you have a block of time to shoot the movie, and that's it. You can't go, well, you, you can shoot in 2019, you know, and, and you're trying to make it in 2017. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't work. you got to shoot it in like a three-month window. So most of the, the, the agencies that we work with to make that happen are really good at uh, allowing that to happen, uh, you know, legally, of course. And some of the, the 
tougher things, I would say, are, and I don't mean to sound negative about it, but uh, because they, they're doing such a great job to turn around, but public lands are always uh, a longer, more drawn-out permitting process for a film company. Oh. And sometimes make it almost to where you don't want to go to public lands, and most of the state is made up of public lands. Yeah, wow, so I would have never thought of that. Sometimes, but, but I'm not saying that they don't recognize that. They do, and they do try to make it better. But that's one thing, that, like, right off the bat, you're going to go, well, I want to try to find it on private property first, uh, because the permitting process, usually, it sometimes doesn't allow you to fit it into your schedule. Depends on what kind of schedule you're on. If you have a long prep time, then you can do it. But let's say you want to film in a week, you may not be able to. So I think that's one thing, but I don't have really anything other than that to say. It's usually involving, you know, permitting processes are probably the toughest thing. Gotcha. Uh, to, to deal with in, in, in the state when it comes to public land. Well, you know, we've kind of mentioned your your experience with uh, nightmare movies on on Elm Street and with Hereditary. Are you generally a horror fan yourself? You mentioned something earlier I am, about. I am. I am very much a horror fan. All right. Much to my wife's chagrin, uh, <laughs> she has not watched it at all. Although I've had her listen to a few this year. From like she'll be in the room not watching, but she'll say, "Yeah, go ahead and put it on. I don't care." <laughs> and um, and so we have, you know, I got her to watch What Lies Beneath. Now I know that's not a horror movie, classic horror movie, <laughs> but it has some. Good, that's about as scary as she'll take it, and I, I love that. But there, you know, there are others uh, that she just won't go that far. Like Hereditary, she, she will not watch that. I've got a few friends who are similar that, you know, they, they enjoy a good thriller or a horror movie, but I've told them, you know, stay away from Hereditary. Unless you're ready for something intense, you got to stay away from this one. I love the Paranormal Activity ones. Okay. I love those, uh, the concepts. But, and I'm going to have a brain cramp here in a second, but I'm just trying to think. A couple of that come out, this one that has like three, four parts that's come out recently, um, you probably know them better than me. The Insidious movies? Uh, Yes, thank you, Insidious. Gotcha. Yes, that was, I watched. I haven't watched the most recent one. Okay. But I was at home sick in November, and they were playing them, and I watched every single one, and I couldn't get enough. Gotcha. Yeah, the first Insidious movie with kind of the the Darth Maul demon thing. That uh, it's one of my. Yes. When I first started getting into horror, that movie just kind of was one of the ones that stuck with me. It was kind of my gateway horror movie, just because it was done so well. Um, yeah. I'm not a huge fan of the ending, but 90% of the movie, I think, is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, and then I really, and of course, the original Exorcist, I had to put that, put off seeing that when I was young. <laughs> uh, my mom my mom said, you can't see that. And then when I got to be 18 or 19, I think I rented it on DHS or something <laughs> and watched it. And that, that was never the same after that. I, that is the scariest movie to me that I've ever seen. Mm. It, changed, it changed me. Like, it made me not, almost not want to watch horror movies stuck with me for so long after it legitimately like to even talk about it right now I get goosebumps because it it affected me so much it was so real to me sure um, I thought it was so well done one of the best things I've ever seen and one of the worst things I've ever seen <laughs> well and that that movie is just such a classic as far as horror goes that you know you you talk to a majority of people and a lot of them are going to say that the exorcist is the scariest movie out there. And you look at any listicle online, and Exorcist is always top three. Um, 100%. And, you know, in my humbled opinion, my little Utah boy opinion, I think Hereditary is going to be the new Exorcist. You know, give it 15 or 20 years, and people are going to look back and say, you know, that that movie terrified me. And I, Well, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly right up there. And then... Another one, I think, was The Exorcism of Emily Rose. That one was pretty scary, too. Oh, that's a brilliant movie. Oh, the story behind that movie where it's rooted in fact. and Oh, oh we could go on and on talking about that movie. <laughs> I know, exactly. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a horror fan. I mean, you give me a, a horror genre done well, and it's my second favorite genre. I know that's going to disappoint you. <laughs> the, uh, the other genre I can share with my family, and that's the the sports movie. And okay. The uplifting sports movie is the one that the family enjoys. So gotcha. I can't turn my back on, on that genre. <laughs> they love it. That's our go-to. But if you get me alone, like 
what am I going to watch tonight? Oh, I'll go right to horror. Okay. okay. Yeah, and I, I'm the same way, you know, morning, afternoon, night, Christmas Eve, I'll, I'll always be down for a good horror movie. <laughs> well, Marshall, it's been a pleasure to have you um, and to interview you. I don't want to take up any more time than we already have. Um, we did want to ask you, is there anything you wanted to kind of let our audience know about the future? Is there anything you're working on right now that's not confidential that you can kind of have your minute to, to have a shameless plug for anything <laughs> you're working on? Well, no, just right now we are hosting uh, Yellowstone, a TV series for the Paramount Network up at, the, at Utah Film Studios, and uh, they have uh, an indefinite lease on the building right now. Uh, we have been giving uh, tours, uh, you know, the studio in between filming times, but it's not really open to the public. We do do some private tours from time to time, so, you know, if you, uh, your co-host or uh, any of your listeners want to get in touch with me, I can certainly... Uh, arrange for some small tours to come to come through and see the studio yeah would be interesting and uh well that's about it in terms of that we are doing a uh interview series you can you can check out on our youtube channel utah film studios we're interviewing uh local crew local filmmakers and posting them and uh and we're doing some really great ones like with uh sterling van wagon we just did one with him the co-founder of the sundance film festival um ruth ruth carter the costume designer for not only yellowstone but black panther uh, wow! Just interviewed her. Wow! So these are these are things that your maybe your listeners can take a look at too, and uh, that's kind of what we're doing now while we have Yellowstone in the building for uh, indefinite. Of course, we're working with Taylor Sheridan, who did Wind River, uh, and you know different genres than <laughs> what your listeners are used to. But nevertheless, uh, it's good to have him in the neighborhood. He lives nearby and has, is uh, calling the studio home right now for his projects. Awesome. All right. Well, again, Marshall, thank you so much for your time and this this wonderful opportunity. She isn't gone. All right. And we're back. Okay. So love that interview. Um, I I really look forward to talking to him again in the future about the Nightmare on Elm Street films. Oh, man. It's going to be so cool to get uh, some more insight on that. Yeah. I can't. uh, it, It was just... It was like you were starstruck, you know, just talking to this individual who has so much experience, not only in cinema, but in these iconic and classic horror movies. It's just really humbling that he took time out of his day to talk to two lowly podcasters. <laughs> so huge thanks, not only to him, but to the Utah Film Studios for allowing us to take time away from him. I look forward to, to being able to learn even more, hopefully you'll take him up on doing a tour maybe we'll, that'll be a special episode in the future because uh, yeah the the more we can kind of get plugged into the local film scene the, the better i think it's really cool to, to kind of see behind the curtain on what what it is that goes into no- making these films absolutely absolutely and it was just again such an honor to interview him and to hear his insight into horror movies in general Speaking of insight, I hear you have some fun insight into Hereditary. Oh my gosh. So going into this movie, as I think I mentioned in our first part, I had no idea it was a demon possession movie, which definitely benefited me, I think, because I wasn't coming in with this demon bias. And by the gods below, they did a phenomenal job with how they represented this demon. It was incredible. I agree. So I guess without uh, further ado, let's let's get into your occult corner and uh, find out a little bit more about this specific demon. All right. So for my occult corner, obviously, if you've seen this movie, you definitely know about the terrible demon that this kind of cult is trying to summon in the movie. And with, in all demonology, if you know the name of the demon, you have power over them. And this demon's lovely name is Paimon, and that's P-A-I-M-O-N. Uh, there are a lot of different kind of spelling attributes, um, P-A-Y-M-A-N, P-A-Y-M-O-N. Um, there's a ton of different spelling. It just kind of depends on, on where you're looking. Payman himself is actually a pretty popular demon that has some representation in a lot of different works. Um, And so to see a a film studio kind of treat him how they did was very, very refreshing as someone who is obsessed 
with demonology and possession movies like this one. And the, the greatest thing I think that they did was they took real occultism and kind of subtly played it out through the entire movie. And then at the end, everything was very true to what the grimoires and the Goetia say about demons, which was really fun. Um, so just some kind of introductory information about this little guy. Um, so payment little is a prince dude. of hell. This little prince oh. of hell and, and all his splendor. <laughs> um, this demon, payment is of the order of dominions. So in a lot of the occult literature, there are different hierarchies of demons, and dominions is one of the highest. So he's, he's pretty important in the throes of hell. Um, he's also believed to be one of the four demons who preside over the cardinal directions with his domain in the West, which is pretty cool um, because this is another kind of throwback to a lot of early pagan beliefs that the four winds were controlled by different individual gods. So again, it's kind of one of those things where you see Christianity and demonology, excuse me, not Christianity, um, paganism overlap. Um, and like I mentioned, his beautiful direction is of the West. He is said to dwell in an unknown location within the Northwest, somewhere on this planet, wherever that may be. Um, and according to the texts, when payment is summoned or brought to this dimension, quote unquote, um, he's preceded by a host's of spirits in the forms of men and women playing trumpets, cymbals, and other diverse musical instruments. And if you remember in the movie Hereditary, at the very end, when this guy's coming to life, you know, Nathaniel, you remember the music was very loud, very or orchestral, a lot of these kind of big noises, the cymbals and the trumpets. So again, there is where they were, you know, really, really authentic to the demon's true identity, which is brilliant. Um, he's also said to manifest with a mighty roar and a booming voice. He comes astride a camel and appears to men, bearing a glorious crown. And again, Hereditary had some of these aspects within the movie. At the very end, they crown the poor kid when he becomes fully possessed by Payman. And this is a throwback to all of this occult literature and it's amazing to, to watch it done in such fluidity. How am I going? Do I sound like a crazy person yet? <laughs> um, getting there. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I know anyone right now who's obsessed about demons as much as me, so I apologize to anyone out there. I'm not a serial killer. Um, some more kind of background information that they kind of hint on in the movie, which again is a throwback to these goetic literatures, is that payment has some of the strongest loyalties to Lucifer, you know, the king of hell. Um, and, he, and by doing that, he commands a lot of the infernal armies. He, some of his powers, according to the literature, is he's able to summon familiars or spirits that do your bidding. And again, the movie does this very, very well with a lot of the animal touches that they do, especially our lovely little actress, who, you know, <laughs> cuts the head off the little bird. And that kind of theme is present throughout the entire movie. Um, something really interesting is in a lot of these occult literature, they use demons not really for the black arts and to take over the world and for murder. They use them to gain information or blessings or power. And that is definitely the case with Payman. Um, when he is summoned, it is said that he can teach knowledge of the arts as well as anything about the sciences. He can reveal the true answers to such mysteries as the nature of the earth, the location of the abyss, and the origins of the wind. Um, he's a veritable font of knowledge, and he can confer that knowledge onto other people. And again, Hereditary did a fantastic job with kind of referencing this at the very, very end of the movie. They have summoned him not to kill, not to murder, but to give them this information and give them this power, essentially. 
which again kind of harkens back i mean you can take it to to paganism that you supplicate different gods based on what information that they can give you and what blessings they can give you well and and i remember in the film that it specifically you know when when she was looking at kind of the the things that had been left by her you know recently deceased mother it it referenced that you know like oh i i did all of this you know for you you know for, for the future generations of my family that that will be blessed by this demon you know and then you know we don't really have the context when that's first presented in the film but you know it's ultimately to, to have received some sort of blessing or or ability and i think it's interesting also that you mentioned that you give powers related to the arts considering that the main character Tony Blood's character annie is an artist right this movie and the directing and just all of these subtle references are just incredibly well thought out and very indicative that this studio and this team did the research and took the time to really present it in a very authentic way so payman's a, a prince of hell so, so who are the other princes all right so this is kind of where it gets a little dicey um in occult literature, there's just so much out there, and not all of it is congruent with one another. You know, you've got the Lesser Key of Solomon, which was written by McGregor Mathers and Aleister Crowley, and, and this is kind of the big focal key point of demonology, especially in modern occultism. And McGregor Mathers also wrote another, well, he didn't write it, so they say he translated it, um, a book called The Sacred Magic of Abramelin the Mage. And these two books kind of go hand in hand and are kind of a guidebook of how to summon demons, how to control them, and essentially how to bend them to your will. And the interesting thing is in The Lesser Key of Solomon, it mentions payment, and I'm actually going to read from that here shortly, but in no regards mentions him as one of these eight princes of hell. That title itself directly comes from this other book that Mathers wrote, The Sacred Magic of Abramelum the Mage. And so there's, you know, this is one of the inconsistencies that Hereditary has, is that they mention that he is when he isn't in a lot of the other literature that's out there. Which is getting really nitpicky because this movie is so perfect, but I had to mention that. Well, well, maybe they subscribe more to that other book. Absolutely, and that, that's very possible. Um, however, you could counter that argument with, well, Mathers wrote The Lesser Key of Solomon as well, so why didn't he include that in there kind of a thing. Um, regardless, none of that answered your question. <laughs> the other eight, well, I guess seven princes of hell um, is a god that's pretty familiar in demonology, Astaroth also known as Astaroth. He's a, a demon you see a lot in magical settings. Um, yep. Then you have the demon Magot. You have another familiar demon who is Asmode or Asmodeus, who you see in a lot of other things as well. Like You've Red got... Wall. Exactly. You've got our other lovely friend, Beelzebub, who's a prince of hell, of course, and who is mentioned in the Bible specifically. Um, and then you have another prince who's named Oriens, who is also attributed with the wind. Um, so it's Oriens, Paimon, Araton, and Emeon. And then you've got Paimon. The sixth would be Araton. Um, also, he can sometimes overlap with Payman in that both Payman and Araton are associated with a very specific demon who's mentioned in the Bible known as Azazel. He's actually my favorite demon, Go Azazel. Um, Azazel's meaning in the original Hebrew is scapegoat. And so there's a big mythos about him being at... Uh, you know, on Lucifer's right hand, and he also fell from heaven, and that's when he became payment, quote-unquote, um, which is how they explain his loyalties to Lucifer in hell. Um, and then the last 
And final prince of hell is Amaimon. Um, also, the Greek translation of Amaimon is Maimon. Also translated into English would be Mammon. And that's also a very um, prolific demon that you find in the New Testament. You know, you cannot serve God and Mammon for either you will hate the one and love the other. And so, yeah, those are our lovely eight lords of the underworld. And only you would have a favorite demon. <laughs> well, I guess yeah. you and, you know, the cults that worship them. <laughs> yeah, maybe. The last thing I kind of wanted to touch on is might creep out any of our more faithful listeners. Um... I would like to read just kind of the paragraph that describes who Paimon is in the Lesser Key of Solomon, which again is the kind of hand guide to summoning demons. What I'll read isn't anything that is supposed to summon him or invoke him or anything like that. The Lesser Key of Solomon actually has very specific guidelines on how to do that. Uh, there's a first, second, and third conjuration, and then you have to bind them, and then if they get out of hand, you have a dismissing invocation as well as a burning invocation. They they cover their bases very good in the Lesser Key of Solomon. Uh, now, but, now d- does any of the summoning of payment involve cutting off your own head with <laughs> uh, piano wire? Uh, no, unfortunately. That would make the book even that much scarier for (laughs) our more faithful listeners. Um, So yeah, this essentially is just kind of a summary of everything I've talked about. Um, It also includes his sigil, which is identical to the one that they use in Hereditary, which again is very refreshing to see. Um, Okay, here I go. Are you ready? Get your white sage and your holy water and your Bible ready. Paimon, the ninth spirit in the order of Paimon, a great king and very obedient to Lucifer. He appeareth in the form of a man sitting upon a dromedary with a crown most glorious upon his head. There goeth before him also a host of spirits, like men with trumpets, and well-sounding cymbals and all other sorts of musical instruments. He hath a great voice and roareth at his first coming, and his speech is such that the magician cannot well understand unless he compel him. So this is kind of where it's going into the invocation process. If someone was to summon Paimon, his voice would be so loud and boisterous that the summoner would not really understand him, and therefore would have to proceed with other conjurations to kind of get him under control. Um, This spirit can teach all arts and sciences and other secret things. He can discover unto thee what the earth is and what holdeth it up in the waters, and what mind is, and where it is, or any other things thou mayest desire to know. He giveth dignity and confirmeth the same. He bindeth or maketh any man subject unto the magician, if he so desireth. He giveth good familiars, and such as can all arts... He is to be observed toward the west. He is in the order of dominations. He hath under him two hundred legions of spirits, and part of them are the order of angels, and the other part are potentates. Now if thou callest the spirit payment alone, thou must make him some offering, and there will attend him two kings of hell called Label and Abelim, and also other spirits who be of the order of potentes and his hosts and twenty-five legions. And those spirits which be subject unto them are not always with him, unless the magician do compel them. His character is this, which must be worn as a layman before thee, which is mentioning his sigil. So yeah, and again, I want to harken back to, to this movie and how well they really portrayed this demon and the process of summoning a demon yeah there were little liberties that they took obviously the the piano wire and the beheading and and all of that but when you kind of take that out of the picture and you look at the occult aspects of it it's almost spot on which is really awesome for a horror movie and especially for a demon possession movie because this genre is just so saturated we got the exorcist which really set the precedent And it sometimes feels like any other demon possession movie out there is just trying to up the exorcist. Um, Or just copying it. 
Exactly. You know, the the corkscrew head and the spider walk and the pea soup vomit and all of that really isn't a good portrayal of what demonology is. Um, Because when you break it all down, demonology as a religion is just supplicating spirits for help with whatever you need. Um, And I probably will be called a blasphemer for saying that, but that's what its core is. It's very similar to, you know, paganism or even supplicating Catholic saints to do what your will. And this movie did it in a very, very respectful, but also honest representation. And I mean, to be fair, it a lot of times it's calling upon these spirits by doing kind of horrific things. But I mean, I guess if, if you believe that you're going to get some benefit from it, then well, I don't know. I guess for for those who are practicing, then the the ends justify the means. Well, and that is the Hollywood behind it. You know, you look through these books and a lot of the rituals to summon these demons are very complex, but complex in that they require the right lunar phase and the right ingredients and to do it at a certain time of the day. And you have to memorize passages and passages of invocations. The whole murder and blood sacrifice is not very accurate to what really goes on in demonology. The more you know. But... It doesn't stop people from looking at me like a crazy person. So, well, hopefully we have a, an audience that is a little bit more willing to not stare at you like a crazy person, or if, if or at least if they are, we can't see it because this is audio. <laughs> there you go. All right. So I guess should we just move on to our last segment of the yeah I'm down the episode. So let's go. So yeah, let's. Uh, this is going to be our first studying the strange in a good while, and so I'm just going to continue my history of uh, horror literature. Um, and today I just want to talk a little bit about gothic horror. Gothic horror really is a, an extension of romanticism which was a artistic movement uh, that started in the late 1700s and spanned through the majority of the 1800s, and uh, even into the early 1900s. And so the, kind of the whole point of romanticism was that it created, a, created different art or uh, literature or philosophy that was kind of focusing more on Ideas like individualism, emotion, uh, glorifying the past, uh, glorifying nature, uh, and, and definitely uh, it put a lot stronger focus on, on things like emotions uh, such as awe and horror and terror and apprehension. And so the darker books and paintings and things that, that were a part of that movement whatever and so the first example that we have of, of a gothic book is uh, was, was actually a book written in 1764 by Horace Walpole and it's called The Castle of Otranto I don't know much about it other than it's considered the first gothic literature book and even though we generally focus on, you know, at least as, as a, an English student, you know, a lot of times we focus on you know, British and American literature and you know, those countries for you know, what, what we see as examples of literature. It is worth noting that it took off in a big way in Germany as well. Uh, they have something called the, I'm supposed to this word, like Schauroman, Schauroman, uh, Sherman, uh, which means Shudder novel, uh, which was just tremendously popular then. And Gothic literature was very popular in both like high literary fiction as well as uh, in uh, a lot of pulp fiction as well. The, the penny dreadful that you hear about that were just literally you know like a penny to purchase and just were churned out by 
writers who just were kind of taking advantage of, of, of the popularity of the day. Um, so some of the writers that we're looking at that, you know, under the Gothic tradition are Anne Radcliffe, Edgar Allan Poe, you know, Stevenson, Lord Byron. Kind of the more familiar authors. Yeah, Stoker, Shelley, the Bronte, uh, some of Dickens' is Gothic, uh, some of Oscar Wilde's writing uh, are, are Gothic literature. Um, and so, I mean, you know, kind of what you're what you're looking at as far as you know, kind of the, the main trope. Uh, you know, we're going to have monsters, we're going to have ghosts, gruesome killers, insanity, depression, revenge. Uh, not everything that is Gothic literature is necessarily horror. Uh, for example, I would say like, *Wuthering Heights* is kind of more of a dark drama than necessarily a horror novel. But you know, generally, you know, we are looking at very dark literature. Uh, and, and, you know, all of the actions, all of the, the plot lines, all of the act, you know, actions that you see in these books are kind of things that are, like, emotionally turned up to, you know, full blacks. You know, no one does very mild, chill things in these, in these stories. Everything is very dramatic. Um, and, in fact, you know, I would say that most of the stories that you see that are in you know, classic Gothic, Gothic literature, if they were... Uh, something new today, you would probably consider them a drama. Okay. Um, so, you know, some notable works. Uh, we have like, The Raven by Poe, Frankenstein, which is also, in, in addition to being a Gothic novel, it's considered by many to be the first sci fi novel. So there in Heights, there's Dracula, there's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, The Portrait of Dorian Gray, uh, Turn into Screw. A lot of our very uh, quintessential horror monsters come from this time monster, the strange strange monster. There's Dracula, you know, the ultimate vampire. There's uh, you know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which is kind of the, the quintessential werewolf novel in many ways. And so, you know, why it's influential on, on horror today is that it set up a lot of the themes and creatures that we use in modern horror, and the gothic style is very popular. You know, if you look at, for example, a lot of the works of Guillermo del Toro, uh, specifically like Crimson Peak, that's straight up a gothic horror film, even though you know it was made just a couple of years ago. We, we still see gothic literature replicated in style and tradition over and over again all throughout time you know, since then, but you know, really it, it did have its heyday in the time. So I guess you have any questions about gothic horror? So are there, you mentioned that these kind of monsters were created, the vampire, the werewolf, and all of that. Is there anything modern that is truly unique that you've come across in, I mean, I guess yeah. you, we could say like Slender Man, which is kind of the modern um, internet monster that has been created, and and a lot of the horror movies specifically, but I guess I'm asking a little bit more iconic, like the vampire, like werewolves or Frankenstein, is there anyone who is celebrated as those in modern times? Yeah, I mean, I would I would argue that as you know, some of the more modern monsters uh, that are kind of big breaks from that would be like the the kaiju, things like uh, like Godzilla would be an example of, of a big break from those earlier traditions. Really, we're going to still see a lot of unique, fresh ideas throughout time, so we are going to go back to the well of, of Gothic literature over and over and over again, because it is still just so uh, full of potential. Right. And and definitely, you know, a lot of the uh, next literary movement that I just talked about, weird fiction, uh, is a big break from a lot of these ideas as well. You know, Lovecraft. So, so yeah, I, I mean, there, there's definitely things that will, will break from it going forward, but it definitely set a lot of the groundwork and also set a lot of the popularity of horror fiction um, that, that we see today. Awesome. Well, this was a very edifying episode. <laughs> yes. We learned a lot. <laughs> that we did. And now everyone can talk about horror literature 
to break the ice and then dive into Payman and scare the pants off of people. All right. Well, so I guess should we just kind of uh, shamelessly plug all of our social media stuff now? Um, yeah, because we shamelessly plug everything that we do on this podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely check us out on our awesome Twitter page. Um, you can At look us spot. Yes, or you can look us up individually. We've got my tag, which is at Crowley Fien, and that's C R O W L E Y P H O E N. And I am N J Darkish, just like you spell it. And we also have not as big as a Facebook following. We are more active on the Twitter. But you can definitely look us up on Facebook by just searching Screen Kings, and we're the first people who pop up, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, we also are going to start doing an Instagram, uh, which I think we just have a, is at Screen Kings Pod as well. I don't think we have any content really yet, but we're, we're going to fix that. Oh, uh, and we are that, also wait. on Patreon. Yes. Uh, which uh, patreon.com slash Screen Kings. So if you just have like $200 lying around and you're looking for a good thing to use it for, here we are! Or or you can pledge like literally any amount and it would go to the podcast, it'll, it'll help us pay for hosting, it'll help us uh, get better equipment, um, any sort of contribution is enormously appreciated and also just even anything you can do to share the podcast, like, share a link, uh, tell a friend. Everything helps the podcast grow, and then you know, we really appreciate it. So, if you see any red eyes staring at you from the bushes, make sure you have your happy thoughts, your holy water, and your white sage. Yeah, and definitely if there's a weird noise like a piano wire uh, being wrapped around a final column, just run. Just run from the house.